So the process that I use with my rails and other more, uh, a little bit whimsical pieces uh, is an additive process. I use soft waxes, I mold them, I shape them, I melt pieces together to add to it. And uh, that is a more organic process. Since I create jewelry that's more representational, uh, I start with some research. So for example, I have this book on whales. Uh, I look online a lot at pictures, um, being very careful that I'm not just looking at another artist's representation of the whale. This is an amazing pearl. It's called a hinge pearl. These are grown in the hinge area of a freshwater mussel, and they have these feather ridge-like details that are fascinating. So I choose something that has some of the characteristics of a part of the animal. In this case, the bucket mouth of a humpback whale. Um, these, this part of the animal can extend further when the humpback whale is feeding. And so this kind of pooches out that way, but it has these little ridges and lines that you will find on a humpback. And you can see it's got excellent luster depending on the kind of artist you are. If you're the kind of artist that likes to feel your project and flow with it as it develops and adapt and change, this might be a more suitable process for you than wax carving. Um, now what I do is I start with the pearl. I draw an outline of it. I, I like to use little retractable pencils uh, with a 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter tip. And so I'm trying to get the outline. Actually, a way to do this is to kind of just trace the outline around the pearl. I like this extreme edge here. That will become the edge of the bucket mouth, so I'll be tilting it a little more. So that makes the pearl a little narrower this way in, in its tilted aspects. Almost always, when I create a piece of jewelry, I will sketch something first even if it's a paper and napkin kind of a sketch. So even if it's just a very simple sketch, it will, it will help orient your mind. So now I draw the beak of the whale. It's interesting how humpbacks have this rather shallow upper jaw. Often, if they have their mouth open a little bit, there'll be a little gap. And I do like to put a little gap into the, into the beak. Uh, in this particular case, I think because of the shape of the pearl and the size of it, and just because I'd like to do so, just because I can, I will curve it down. So the body will be going down like this. You can see on the whales, you have about a third of the body to the fins to these long, long fins that they have, a third to this, I believe it's called a pectoral fin up here, and then a third to the tail. This will be a large, a large whale, which I like. I, uh, I've created some very big whales and um, uh, I, I want to meet somebody in Astoria that's actually wearing it at the waterfront, but I haven't, haven't seen somebody wearing it yet. I will cast this in silver, in a special kind of silver that contains some palladium. And then I will put some gold details onto it to, to kind of pop. I'll add some gemstones, some little diamonds, and I like to bring some color into it. So I'm gonna bring this out further And then the tail will come down here. I'll also kind of flip it a little. You can see the tail, the tail actually comes off perpendicular from the body of the whale, but I'm gonna tilt it a little as I'm designing this. I work on these sketches until I'm happy with it and can kind of envision what I will be doing in the actual um, piece itself. I, I'll let the design kind of speak for itself and, and develop. Um, now I want to put in the flukes, which are almost like arms, and they're huge. 
on these whales. They're very large. The fins especially, I usually put a lot of detail in later in the wax. Barnacles, the barnacles might be out of um, gold um, and maybe with um, a little tiny diamond set into them just to kind of make them pop. Um, you want to create something where you where the eye later on discovers a lot of little details. The spout in this situation is just about right in the center of the design and what I like to do is create uh, my bale hidden behind the spout. So, I, so I'll have a spout of water coming coming out here and then the bale will be hidden there the bale is the portion that the chain runs behind. And then I will have little diamonds sparkling in the spout that will that are reminiscent of water droplets. And there's actually a, a company in Vancouver that has fair trade gems. They're a little more expensive, but you know that they've treated the miners well. This is a nice representation of what I'll be creating. I'm really excited about this one. I think he's got a lot of personality. Lovely. Yeah, this, this is going to be a cool piece. And I'm excited to share this with you and to share the process. Nice. Well, to be fully alive, it needs to be three-dimensional or at least appear in three dimensions. I'm going to try to keep it somewhat flat so that it will hang properly but have the illusion of three dimensions. I'm going to first retrace the outline of the piece in black so that it darkens it up some. And uh, that's so that I can uh, cut my wax out using the outline as a guide. Okay, so I'll maybe accentuate that a bit. This is a Sharpie. Sharpies are your friend. Okay, so now that I've drawn this, I can see the outline better. Now what I will do is I will cut my wax out very roughly and it will be larger, wider than the piece itself. So here I will actually make this bucket quite large. And what I'll be doing also is the fence I'll be cutting out separately and adding later. Okay, now this wax you can actually push out and it's not perfect and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's an interpretation of nature, and each whale is going to have its own personality in nature. Um, each whale has its own character. Be careful with the X-Acto blades. More industrial accidents happen with these than any other tool. I'm wiping silicon mold release on. So now I put the pearl in its position and I form the wax around it. So I'm uh, trying to find the right position for the pearl in the wax. You can see how flexible and forgiving the material is. So I'm actually pushing this down in. If you'll look at that, do you see the back there? Mm -hmm. How deep that goes in there? I'm actually forming a a bucket for the bucket mouth. See how, how much I'm bending this and moving it about? And I'll probably give him a little bit of an open mouth and or her and uh, um, thereby uh, giving it kind of a dramatic effect. So I'm taking some of the soft wax off the same sheet, putting it, depositing it on my wax pen Back in this tra transition, I'm going to build up the wax a little bit. This is a rather deep pearl. I'm uh, building up this jaw now to blend in to meet the body. Uh, I've removed some of the wax around the bucket. 
where it's not needed. You saw the bucket holding the pearl went in the other direction this way. Now the body is going in this direction. I've spliced in a sheet. You can see the seam there. Maybe from the top you can see it also. In order to create more of a cup shape in the back, a hollow cup to keep the weight down. Some of my whales um, are not as dramatic as, as this. They're maybe a little more whimsical. This one here will be quite dramatic. Well, I've used the uh, inlay wax, which is a heart buildup wax, and float a bunch into the imperfections and into the transitions. Built up a little bit more with that. This is one of my favorite wax tools. It's got a sharp end here. I've sharpened this so that you can scrape with it very nicely. Oh, yeah. And this has a blunter rounded end here to scoop with. So once in a while you want to use a brush and a little uh, broad toy paintbrush like this or a basting brush is fine. In fact, sometimes I intentionally put anomalies on there and will use some reticulation or um, fusing of metals onto the of other metals fusing onto onto the silver uh, mostly gold onto the silver but you can also um, solder little copper pieces on and and such so so you can get some really interesting effects i want to smooth those areas make sure that they look natural that my wheel isn't looking like it, like I actually did carve it. I want it to look like it swam into my studio. <laughs> I think it needs some flukes. What I've done is I've cut some flukes out of sheet wax to kind of follow the, those lines. You can see that this is a very huggable whale in a hurry. Uh, and then I attach it here. It's important to have plenty of support um, for these long appendages that stick out. You don't want them to catch and bend. Whales are amazing. They're such enormous giants and yet they're so graceful. I will place it coming from the back so that it kind of crosses over like so. I have attached a rear fluke at the tips and uh, I like it protruding towards the front. I think that's a nice look. Mm -hmm. It really gives it more three-dimensionality to have that additional one come up to the front. So all I have to have is the spout part even that, I'm, uh, as I'm thinking about it, I may do that by fabrication and directly out of metal. Um, that I think will give me a nicer look because it will be a really clean wire detail look. And uh, I can do that in gold, in yellow gold, to contrast with the, uh, with the silver whale. This, this is going to be a cool piece. And... I'm excited to share this with you and to share the process. Uh, it's, I select a color here of sapphire to complement some of the tones that you have in the pearl. You can see there's some orange tones there. There's actually also some violets. I could have played off of that as well. But uh, this is a gorgeous burnt orange Montana sapphire, natural Montana sapphire. Uh, that will be a wonderful addition to this piece to make it come to life. Right now the piece is a little plain looking. It's actually kind of an empty canvas right now or a frame to put the canvas into. Uh, and We're going to do some painting today. Uh, we'll paint with gold on this silver. This is continuum silver. I'm going to get my pearl out of here a little bit. Um, continuum silver is a palladium alloy and uh, it has a higher melt point and has some wonderful qualities over just 
conventional sterling. It's it's harder, it's uh, somewhat tarnish resistant, it can be fused, which is a property we will take advantage of here. I have some natural gold nuggets. It's a wonderful material to play with and it will give a nice touch to this. I'm noticing there are some spots on the pearl where the pearl is not quite seated yet. And so I get my French Sharpie out and I look at the pearl and I look at where it has contact with the silver and needs to go down a little bit further. And this is so that I have uh, kind of a prong coming up that keeps the pearl from sliding out. It doesn't have to go over the top, but it acts as a stop. So what I'm doing here now is I'm carving away on the inside of my marks. I'm making multiple passes, I'm not using too much pressure because I don't want to take too much material away. Repeatedly shave off material and then you try your gem to see how it sits in there. So now it slides in there and fits down further. There, that's very nice. So now I'm placing some 24 karat gold nuggets onto the piece. They're actually little tiny Plaza gold flakes. Um, I've coated the piece with boric acid and alcohol um, so that uh, the alcohol, um, so it helps clean the piece first of all and breaks surface tension, uh, absorbs impurities, it helps the uh, to facilitate the fusing process. Because what we'll be doing is without using solder we will be bringing the piece up very close to the melting point. In fact, it will be starting to melt on the very surface and uh, the gold will bond in place. And it's a lot of drama, I mean, to actually have gold nuggets on your piece. So now I'm, I'm heating the piece slowly because what will happen is the boric acid that's on the piece will foam up a little bit, will become liquid and foam up. And if I go too fast, these nuggets will go flying off of my piece. So it's got to heat up slowly so that it doesn't pop around too much. Now the fusing that we're going to do will be in one area at a time because um, I would not have enough control and it's hard to make out uh, how hot each part is getting so I'm going to first preheat the entire piece. Now you have to watch out for thinner areas like the beak, the jaw, the flukes um, that you because they will heat much faster than the rest of the body and I don't want to overheat those areas. So I'm going to concentrate on the body first here. There comes a point when it starts to glow. This is going to have a good solid glow to it. Um, but uh, what I'm especially looking for is there'll be a shininess on the surface of the metal that indicates that it's fusing. And we're not there yet. Look at how richly that is glowing. It's a bright red color now. We're close to the fusing point. Now if you heat it too high, the gold and the silver will melt into each other. And uh, you don't want that to happen either. Okay, it's starting to fuse. Um, when you see a little bit of shininess around the individual gold nuggets, then you know you're fusing. The gold nuggets themselves are starting to melt some. Okay, that's beautiful there. 
I want to actually overheat it a tiny bit to achieve what's called reticulation to some degree because I want a rough skin on the silver. So do you see that kind of rippling a little bit on the surface there? Right there, see that? It's getting uh, not only shiny, but it's starting to get a little bit rough. This is a tricky process because you could melt the whole thing if you don't watch, if you're not careful. I'm actually not looking at where I have the flame. I'm looking at the very tip of the beak because I don't want that to start to melt. That's where it would start to ball up. Ah, there, see that? A little bit of surface reticulation happening. There, did you see that fuse down? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. You can see that glow. It's pretty amazing, actually. So you can see that the gold nuggets look like the barnacles that you would find on one of these old giants. It's a pretty cool look. Nice contrast to the, to the silver. Now I'm working on the spout. The spout I've decided to fabricate. You could make it out of wax, but it's a nice clean look to fabricate it. So this part is gold. I've balled up the end here by melting it. I've made three additional pieces here that are silver. So I'm going to solder a bundle of these together. Pick up some solder. You could just place a ball of solder on that instead of doing it this way. Okay. I want to, this one to come off in the front. Doesn't matter exactly how it comes off, but that's good there. There's a nice little spout. So now I have a little bit of solder on there. You can see when that starts to melt, which is good. I'm being careful to direct the flame away from the piece. There we go. Um, it's tricky. Some of this is, is just touch and experience too. But I'm being careful not to hit these high points here. Heat rises. Heat heats um, thinner pieces before heating larger pieces. So you can solder with the preset diamonds. Now the bundle I've soldered together with hard solder, so that will hopefully not be as likely to come apart. Okay, that's on there straight. So that's one diamond here. These are meant to look like a, the, a spray of water. So I'm trying to add maybe one more stone here. Okay, got a good flow there. So the piece has been assembled. The um, bale has been soldered on in place. Uh, I've cleaned the metal thoroughly so that it doesn't have skin acids or other dirt on it. And uh, all the stones are set. A uh, little bit of the pre-finishing has been done, but I'm leaving the metal in kind of a rough state on the surface because I'm hoping to get some variation in how it will take the oxidizer. I'm using an oxidizer. It will blacken the surface of the metal. And uh, this works very well on sterling silver. It will not oxidize the gold so that we make that gold pop. I apply it. You see how it gets a beautiful black there. Oh, I love the way this is taking it differently. Now we will work on the details of this piece. This kind of looks cool to me. It's actually a, uh, an interesting look, these, this streaking on the inside of the piece, the bluish edges of it. Very interesting. 
The idea with this tool is to touch up the silver to where it's polished in spots and dark in others. That creates the, uh, that really accentuates the three-dimensionality of the piece. And it simulates what you see, what the eye sees when it would see a whale like this. Just like if you were painting and you're trying to show how the light would fall on an object. So the light is coming kind of from up here, catching a bit of the tail and would catch this area here. I selected this pearl, the hinge pearl, in part because of the golden bronze tones in it and how they work with the Montana sapphire as well as with the natural gold nuggets in the piece and the, all of the gold detail in the spray. I will sign my name and the metal content on the back here. This is continuum sterling and the secondary metal is gold. There's 24 karat gold there and 14 karat gold. So it's time to set the pearl. It's uh, um, always a wonderful step to be at. Um, one thing that's tricky for and for a jeweler, I don't, I, I imagine it's similar with other artists, but as you're getting towards the end, you're kind of excited, and it's very important not to miss a step or to uh, get sloppy at the very end, because you don't really need too much epoxy. Okay, time to take your pearl. Put it in place. I'll use this brass pusher. I'm being careful not to uh, slip over the pearl with this. And the, this is an interesting tool in that it's a little bit rough on the surface and that's so that you don't easily slip. And I will burnish the silver into the pearl, onto it, until it conforms to the shape of it. Again, it's important not to slip onto the pearl, but to work right next to it. That's pretty good. That pearl isn't moving much, and the epoxy will do the additional work that it's supposed to do. This will act as the last little stop that keeps that pearl from coming out. you're having visited my studio and looking over my shoulder, you're welcome back anytime.